All right, so welcome to everyone who's joining us on the Scheduled Detox 2.0. This is the results webinar. I'm Marjorie Siegler. I'm one of the co-founders of Transformed, along with my uh, colleague, Jill Wiener, the other co-founder of Transformed. And we'll introduce herself in a second. And also the winner of our uh, Five Days, Five Ways uh, Scheduled Detox Challenge, which is Dr. Aaron Stevens. And wow. we'll also introduce herself in a minute. A few housekeeping items I want to make people aware of is uh, that the chat is private. So while Jill and I can see it, nobody else can. You may have seen notes from us, but uh, it's set to, to have total privacy. So feel free as you're joining, if you're catching this live, it doesn't work on the replay, unfortunately, to go ahead and type us in comments, your thoughts, your experience from when you did uh, the challenge, or really, you know, any type of uh, anything that you want to contribute. And we will moderate that and, and incorporate it as well. Um, the other thing is we will be briefly recapping some of the, the five uh, challenge days. And in each of those days, I certainly did use some ideas um, that are not mine. And the authors of those books or those ideas are appropriately cited in the challenge material. So I'm not going to do that again here for the sake of time and just to be sure I don't leave anybody out. Um, so uh, in, in brief, so I'm Marjorie Siegler. I'm a physician. I'm the co-founder of Transformed. As I mentioned, this is totally a one-of-a-kind uh, retreat professional retreat for women physicians. And so we really take a hands-on and, and very holistic look into life alignment, which is work, personal, and family, self, everything. And so we got so excited about the idea of doing something year round, because we do these events just once a year uh, live in January. And we just kind of wanted to keep going with that momentum. And so this is the first year we've done a uh, virtual challenge on social media. So um, I thought this was, this was really awesome. Um, I am an anesthesiologist by training, and I have been uh, working in retreats and, and consulting for about 10 years now in, in career development types of activities. Um, Jill, take a minute to introduce yourself and then kick it over to Erin for an intro. Sure. So I'm Jill Wiener. I uh, practiced hospital medicine for 10, 10 years and went from becoming the least likely person ever to meditate to like the most hardcore meditator you've ever met in 2011 when I was burnt out. Decided to become a teacher uh, after several more years of successful practice. Now I'm a meditation teacher and I work with physicians to help them um, get out of survival mode and into their intuition and the joy in life. And Marjorie and I are med school classmates and we are good friends and we created Transform Together because you can't fix the person if the person is in fight or flight mode and in survival mode all the time um, for many reasons. So we've created this incredible um, retreat and now we're here to do this, um, these incredible challenges with you. And it's been so much fun seeing um, what everyone's been doing in real time. And we're just meeting Erin for the first time because Erin yes. has not been at any of our retreats, but um, this was super exciting. Again, love watching your, your Instagram stories. Um, give us a brief intro to yourself. Sure. So my name is Erin Stevens, though on social media, I go by Erin Sherman, which is my married name. And I originally set that up when I lived in Montana because people tagged me a lot uh, in posts. I didn't really, really want to be tagged in on that level. So I have my professional side of things and then I have my personal side of things. So, um, but I am a GYN oncologist. I've been in practice now for seven years. Um, I spent my first five years of my career in Montana uh, in a multi-specialty group with multiple partners. And then about a year and a half ago, I moved to Wisconsin and I'm in a multi-specialty group, but I am an, the only GYN oncologist in my group. Um, so a lot of transition. Uh, I actually found out about Marjorie through the Association of Women's Surgeons and the speaker series there. Um, and then on following people on social media, saw this challenge and it was right at the time that I was hitting my point of, I think I'm doing too much. <laughs> and it was perfect. And it actually made me wait even two weeks longer than I intended to. Cause I'm like, if someone's got a system of how to do this, that's what I need. I need Amazing. to not make this up. So yeah. that's how I got involved in the challenge and I'm honored Super. to be the winner of it. Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> That really is perfect. Um, and I think, you know, one of the one of the overarching things about this, if I don't forget to say it more often, is that this is, I think, an activity that we ought to do on a semi-regular basis, right? Mm -hmm. Because the things that we really want at one time that are an amazing opportunity become something different later in life. 
sometimes yeah. they stay the same, you know, what, what we want and, and what we don't want and what we have uh, interest in and bandwidth for really evolve and change. And I think what a lot of people don't do, just like with our actual closets at home, is we just don't clean it out, right? We just don't pay attention to that. Uh, and even things that we can kind of rationalize, as we'll talk about a little bit here, as not being that big of a deal, so not really worth tackling, I would argue are re they really are worth tackling because they hang out there in sort of the ether of our subconscious, I think, and make us stressed. Um, so our plan for today is we're going to briefly recap the challenges. So I'm going to kind of go through days one through five in, in a super abbreviated form. Um, I will ask Erin to chime in on sort of how each of these days went for her and, you know, anything that was a big win or a sticky. Um, Jill has a few things as well that was noteworthy. We did, of course, get um, everybody else's social posts and some emails. So we'll be introducing some of those anecdotes that seem instructive. Um, wow, my Twitter is blowing up right now, but that's not the time right now. So <laughs> noise. Um, and uh, we, and then we're going to get to at the end, which I think is going to be really exciting, some um, some sort of next level things with Aaron, where where we kind of got, got to the end of the five days, and then what happened? Some really neat stuff, yes. as it turns out, happened, which I just only found out about hours ago. So um, we're going to do that. And then uh, if you are following this on the replay, or if you're taking this challenge on demand, because as soon as we're done with this, we're going to make it available for folks to take on demand. And I really encourage you to, to continue to uh, post on social media and tag us because we do want to give you that encouragement. So even though, if, you know, if you're doing this uh, months from today, you can still have that sort of feeling of camaraderie and encouragement by tagging mm -hmm. folks, um, particularly the transformed account, uh, Jill's account, my account, and we will uh, put all this information here with the replay. Um, okay, so day one in a nutshell, this this is the first activity, a kind of a list of all the roles and goals. And essentially we ask people to just write down as many things they could possibly think of that were responsibilities, expectations, obligations, and sort of persons that they were, how they showed up in their life. This is one of the first things we do at the Transformed event because it is sort of the backbone of the entire event. And it, for many people, starts off seeming simple and then becomes insanely long. I don't know, Erin, what was it like for you when you began? Yeah, I actually have my little book with me and oh, okay. I did it and it was like, oh, okay, oh wait, oh wait, next page, oh wait, another page. And then things that started coming up on the last day where it's like I finished and I was like, oh yeah, wait, I do those things too. Or yeah, uh, yeah. as you said, like, what are some of the things you don't make time for anymore that you want to make time for? So putting those on my list, I thought was really helpful as well. So, um, but making the list was kind of easy because it was going through my calendar. It was going through all of those things. And then some, part, some things I put on there included like, you know, my work email, my Gmail account, my hot, like the, the incessant email checking I'm doing, yeah. the documentation I don't like doing at work, but that's part of jo my job. Like those types of things, just to remind me that there are some parts that I could get better on that aren't even just resigning from committees. Absolutely, and uh, that's so great that you mentioned that because I especially love that you went back and added some things because it's true. We have, there are people that you are or that you sort of used to be and don't allow yourself time to be, and I don't mean just you, me too, Jill and yep. everybody. Um, you know, parts of us that that belong on that list, but maybe just aren't active right now, are sort of in hibernation, or we're on the back burner. But they got to go on the list, or there's no way to balance that. And mm -hmm. we do recommend for this challenge, as you said, to take a look at things like your calendar, your email accounts, even your CV, to really um, remember all of the things that keep on going as you keep on writing, and then to think about, you know, your community, family, and other relationships too. Um, and at the event, what we find for most people, the reason I added uh, those sort of checks to say, make sure you look at this and this and this, is because at Transformed, when we do this on the first day, most people take just a, a little time, five minutes, write down some stuff. And then as we're kind of going around and beginning to share, people realize they've left out these enormous chunks of their life. They either forgot themselves entirely, happens a lot. People do not write down their own hobbies or their own interests or their own just sort of self. Um, people, some people take a very concrete view and anything that's sort of writable downable on a, on a CV or like as a title, that's what they write. And then other people view themselves in sort of more of their social functions. So, you know, kind of, are they the peacekeeper of the family or somebody this past year said they were the boat rocker. Um, 
maybe in their family or maybe at work. I can't remember. But, you know, describe kind of their the way in which they saw themselves interacting with the people and the sort of systems in their life, including work. Um, and the other thing that happens often at the retreat now is that after people get a couple meditation sessions on their belt, they have access somehow to sort of much more clarity and they just mm -hmm. add to that list. So we have a workbook that's many pages long. And now I've not only have I seen it in life, but I've seen it even just with what you just showed us. I haven't seen that before. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's pages, yeah. right? Pages. And so we use that as the basis of the rest of the four days of the retreat. And it was sort of the basis of the rest of this challenge, right? Mm -hmm. So this takes us into day two, where you know we go back and we look at that list and we sort of categorize each of the things in terms of the way that they got on their plate. And of course, I'm not going to repeat those lessons here, but in general, we were looking at whether or not they were something that was actively pursued or that someone kind of foisted upon you that even at the time you knew you didn't want to say yes to, but sort of did anyway, which we're calling accommodating. And then there's um, the avoiding, which is just sort of when you don't you don't say no, but you also don't say yes. But so it kind of keeps coming to you and the um, uh, and the um, accumulating, which is stuff that you probably either acquired or accommodated once and now just haven't reassessed. So somebody shared with me this quote in my email a couple weeks ago that said, um, and I, I have since posted on social media, so forgive me if you've already seen it, something like overwhelm is the abundance you always wanted. And it was really interesting. Did you see me post that or did you see it? Yeah, I got some good comments and reactions. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see that, but I can totally agree with that statement. Yeah, it was um, it was remarkably polarizing is maybe the wrong word, but some people felt really negatively about that. And some people felt really positively, but almost everybody could relate in some way, like mm -hmm. it connected um, in some way. And I think a lot of people thought, well, I don't, you know, I don't want I did not always want to be overwhelmed. We don't, nobody wants to be overwhelmed, but in a way it's wonderful to have so much opportunity such that you could be overwhelmed. Uh, but then if you don't know how to get out of it, you don't know how to get out of it. I don't know. Yeah. Jill, what were, what were your feelings? About um, I, I think my thought on it, cause I was sort of, I did the like questionable face. You, you were like smiley face, questionable face or frowny face or something like that. I, I, with I, I feel like overwhelm is a mindset and I feel like abundance is a mindset. So I feel like, wishing for abundance doesn't always think you know, like creating and manifesting abundance doesn't always lead to that. It's like the mindset that you bring into it. So I didn't like go into that in the comments or anything, but that, that was my funny face pause with that was I, I, I liked it and it was like a good conversation sparker, but I felt a little bit like we don't have to be overwhelmed. We can still be really we can have abundance, have yeah. joy from the abundance. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Or you, or you look at it as if overwhelm is not, does not have a negative connotation to it. Like mm -hmm. you switch it to abundance, it sounds like a wonderful thing. Yeah. But right. you can be happily overwhelmed and that doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. Um, Maybe, yeah, I like think, it's, it's, it's semantics. Like, look, yeah. I yeah. like that. Well, it was interesting because it did, and, and for folks who are on right now, please feel free to, this is a great time to use the chat and just, you know, share with us what you think about that. Some people replied to me about that comment and they basically said, you know, this is part and parcel of that myth or that brainwashing that we do to ourselves in medicine, which is that if you're so busy and if you're paying your dues and if you have opportunities and if your plate is full, then lucky you and you better be, you know, like happy about that, right? That that, that is somehow abundance um, and that it is favorable, right? And that 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 and the person, of course, is sharing that felt like that's not that's not how that works. And it's sort of a detrimental narrative that we may tell ourselves. So anyway, without going, I mean, we could maybe spend an hour talking about that. <laughs> and um, and people have really interesting comments about it. But I thought, yeah, you know, uh, uh, having an abundance of things, having a long list in and of itself is, is a neutral thing. Right. The the importance about it is how does it make you feel? Is it aligned with things that, you know, sort of ser serve your values and your purpose and you feel you're doing meaningful work that you feel good about? Um, are they things that stress you out? Are they things that you, you know, what what are they to you? And so um, at Transformed, as I mentioned, we do a lot with values. So we do several hours worth of sessions. And this is something that if folks are interested, and Aaron, if you're interested, if you haven't seen this yet, <laughs> if you go to my blog, if you, it's marjoriestegelermd.com, if you go to my blog, um, and we'll, we can put a link to where we post this replay, um, you can see a link to the True Values Challenge that I did earlier uh, in, in, well, in 2018. We did it on Twitter. And basically what we did is propose, you know, 
which would you rather this one or that one two values that sound really really good um, and you know um, again without getting into that in detail here things like you know having autonomy and having stability like most people like both of those but very often there's a trade-off in life um, certainly as as Jill knows and have you know with an entrepreneurial spirit right if you're going to run your own company then you for sure have all the autonomy on you know in the world <laughs> and also have a whole lot of instability um, and that works really well for some people and not well for others. And there's no judgment there, right? It's just what, what, what works for you. So looking at your list from a lens of, of your values is really important. But since I knew that was too big of a project really to do meaningfully, I think in this challenge, we kind of limited it to like, how did it get there? And in a sort of in a, in a nutshell way, is it something that you pursued once? Is it something you always kind of never really wanted, but you allowed and so on? Um, that might just kind of speak for itself unless Aaron, you want to share anything about your list. No, I was going to say a lot of, um, a lot of what I had on my list was things that I acquired, things I sought out, things I wanted. And then mm -hmm. I had the accumulated accommodated. I didn't nearly have as many avoided, um, but accumulating and accommodating was really kind of where I was. I, I was and needed to sort through those. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I think that happens a lot. And it's all wrapped up, right, in, in emotions uh, to some degree. A lot of them, I think, subconscious, because there's um, we hear a lot from people who attend the conference that or the retreat that, you know, if you worked hard to get something, especially if, you know, one of your sponsors or mentors went out on a limb to like get you there, right? And like somebody's capital was spent getting you where you are. Mm -hmm. and then how can you possibly not want it anymore? But that's silly, of course, over time. I mean, there's a, a time frame perhaps to, to give to things before you're ready to move on. And it kind of loses sight of the fact that somebody else probably really wants that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Someone, you know, I mean, in the same way that when we were all first starting out, we had nothing on our plate. So we all were like hoping to get, you know, any little bite of a committee or something. Um, and I guess I'm speaking from an academic lens because that's what I did really the first you know, 10 years of my career. Um, Still private practice. I mean, I think that yeah. especially because I was a subspecialist, I was trained to participate and do things and stuff. So I wanted to be on committees. I wanted to be on national committees. I wanted to be on hospital committees. I wanted to, so I, I, I don't think, I don't think it's just academics. I think private practice, it is still very much there. Is it? That's mm -hmm. great to know. I, I think it's probably, I mean, academic time is shrinking these days, you know, anybody's protected time. Mm -hmm. um, it's like almost laughable, but in private practice, it must be also because you eat what you kill there, right? Right, I mean, you're supposed to be working. Like, you know, yeah, that's work. Is, right, the, but there is no, this doesn't count for me for patient contact. This is not right. going to make me any money. It's good for the community. It's good for my hospital community and my greater community that mm -hmm. I live in, but it's not bringing my practice in any additional money. And mm -hmm. so um, I'm grateful that both places I've practiced have valued participation in the community of the hospital mm -hmm. and of the greater community. Um, but I can totally see that not being the case as well. Yeah. And for a lot of people, our participants, it is not the case. And increasingly, I guess, in private practice and in academics, it's volunteer work, mm -hmm. which doesn't make it wrong. In fact, it makes it often very fulfilling. But if we really get down to it, it's like you're volunteering your time at that point, because that's where, you know, you've got those colleagues who say, well, I don't do any of that. I just go home, you know, and you guys make the same amount of money. Yeah. So obviously life is not all about money, but th there is that layer, right? Mm -hmm. um, Jill, jump in if you want to, I don't. Yeah, nothing, nothing right the second to <laughs> Okay. So then, so we looked at that on day two and really figure out how stuff got there. I know for me, it's interesting that you had said nothing, very little for you, Aaron, is um, avoided. I think I have a lot that's avoided, which is funny because I don't think I realized even until I did this exercise along with ourselves, with the challenge, that I had so much that was sort of being avoided. I have maybe a unique set of circumstances in that a couple of years ago, my husband was diagnosed with cancer. And at that time, I did like a, I wiped the slate clean and I did yeah. do an official outreach to all the committees, all the, every, 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 you know, the littlest thing. And I got myself off, but you know, people are supportive and many of them said, well, we won't expect you to do anything at all. You know, we totally understand. Just let us know when you're ready to come back. And, you know, somehow or another, I stayed on those listservs. So in an official capacity, somebody 
probably replaced me, but like I'm still on the list. Mm -hmm. And I just haven't felt a reason to go and say, you know, actually, like, let's be honest, I haven't done anything in this three years. I'm not going to now. You guys don't need me. You don't miss me. <laughs> but it's just sitting there. And it, it occurred to me, of course, everyone's different, that I get a fair amount of stress because my inbox is full of reply alls and listservs about conference calls that I'm not going to be going to. And it's not as if I even need to make that decision. Like, I know I'm not going to go to it. I'm going to delete mm -hmm. it immediately which then raised the question, why am I, why don't I just close the loop on this and, and end, right? It, it, maybe that's the same as accumulation, except for that I sort of had ended it, but it, it, it stuck around and I just didn't bother, right, to tackle it. I think part of the reason I didn't have a lot of avoided is because I've only been in part of this group for a year and a half. So I've been more conscious about yeah. when I accept something, I can totally see where five, six years from now, and looking back at my five years I spent in Montana of yeah. things that had I made this list two years ago, it would be a very different list. And it probably would have had a lot of avoided on it or things More that I felt like I had to do because I thought that was my role. Yeah. Um, even though I could have, should have handed that out to somebody else. So that's really interesting that you say that because that is another thing that we just hear sort of constantly is we're all doing the things that we think we're supposed to be doing, right? That we think is our role, that we think are sort of the story that we're supposed to be living in terms of what success looks like or what hard work looks like or whatever, whatever the sort of case may be of what we tell ourselves. And in hindsight, looking back at that, do you think some of that was, certainly it was something you feel you could have gotten rid of, but was it also something that you should have been doing or is that oh, that, <laughs> that could be a lot. Um, uh -huh. I think part of it was I that was very much part of my identity at that point in my career. And so I felt like I, as chair, I should be on all these committees. I should be going to this. This should be my job. And I actually felt like I was protecting my partners. Like, I'm not going to burden you with this. I'll do it. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Um and that didn't lend well to where I ended up in a very bad phase of burnout because of it. Um, and it also, I, as I, we talked a little bit in through email, it led to me being at a lot of tables that I had forced myself into, but was not really invited into. And so I would sit at tables and I would speak and I would be adamant about my great ideas. Nobody actually wanted to hear them because um, I wasn't invited. Uh, even if I was there. And so it was very interesting to see a difference in accepting my committees here and my roles here um, and being sought out for that as opposed to feeling like I needed to be there and needed to be doing that. So This is maybe a little bit of a departure from our intended agenda, but do you have any um, reflections on the, the things for which people are inviting you to the table or asking you to be at the table mm -hmm. as compared to the things that you were trying to kind of force your way in on, do, do you have any um, thoughts about what's qualitatively different about those two things? Like what makes somebody want you at the table versus not? Um, so interestingly, they are the same types of committees here mm -hmm. and there. Um, they're surgical governance type committees or OR councils or whatever people call their surgical leadership. It is the cancer center leadership. Um, I think part of it is this, I've been in practice now, so I'm not figuring out how I practice medicine mm -hmm. while I'm trying to also do leadershipy stuff. I yeah. am, I know who I am as a surgeon. I know who I am as a GYN oncologist. I'm still figuring out what, if any leadership things I want to do. Um, and I was very, I was much more reflective. I, um, in Jill's going into meditation part, I think I changed a great deal after burning out and realized and did a lot of self-reflection back on it. And I think I would approach everything I did then differently, but I wouldn't have known to, to approach it differently. Do it differently. Yeah. So, so I came in when I was asked to be on the um, surgical governance committee, I directly told the CEO, I have been a part of these before. 
and I'm going to say things that you don't want to hear. That is what I do. I voice the things that everybody is thinking. No one wants to say. I often don't say it nicely. I often say it negatively because I'll play the devil's advocate. doesn't even mean if I believe it. I'm just going to bring up all the things we need to do. I said, and people don't like that. And that has gotten me in a lot of trouble in the past. And the CEO looked at me and he said, that is exactly why I want you on this committee. And I had never, ever been told they wanted me for that voice. And they have actually been very, very, they, they have asked me things. They have questioned, like, is there things we're missing? Aaron, do you want to speak up on something that you've heard you're concerned about? And so I've, I've appreciated that part of being invited to the table. Yeah. Um, It sounds like, you know, so what I, what I hear in what you're saying is that, that there, that now you have essentially a professional brand of thought leadership. Someone knows if they bring you to the table, you're going to speak up. This You'll is be what proactive. I'm doing. You're going to poke the holes in all the rosy pictures and see how can we make this better? Where are the vulnerabilities? Like what is, what are we talking about here? And we'll have those difficult conversations and leaders want somebody like that, but perhaps they want to know that that's who they are bringing in. Yes. Right. That would be the thing. And so this is also something that I have a fair amount on my website if people want to come check out my professional branding stuff. But this is also part and parcel. See, all these things weave together um, at the Transformed Retreat where we really talk about, you know, how to let people know what it is that's your unique value. What are you bringing to the table? Because you're excellent at that. And that's where you belong, right? Doing that kind of work. You don't belong in some other committee where that kind of work is either not valued, right? Because you won't be valued, you won't be happy. uh, Or, you know, if if a person doesn't if they're expecting you to do something else then expectations aren't met and so that leads to friction but when they know what they're getting and even better they know there's not a lot like you i mean that's a pretty unique thing not everybody comes to the table that way <laughs> and it is of high value so the important thing um and again I'll, I'll bring us back to this challenge but the important thing with you there is really to you know to recognize that you have a solid brand of thought leadership for which now you're known and you know, were you to go back and kind of do over, it might be something that you deliberately cultivate. Like here's, here's kind of my thing. Here's what I do. Here's what I do, you know, better than others. Other people don't like being that person, but I do, you know, like people can count on you to be that person, meet that need that that's a unique skill. So it's really an asset, but when it's deployed in the wrong way and in the wrong setting, then it's causes friction. So anyway, good. One of the coolest things about, um, you know, I think Marjorie and I both are like, like love fest at transform because I one of the things I love watching you do is 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 help people understand that a personal brand doesn't mean like I'm starting my new box of like my new business of like selling you know CBD chocolate Which um, you as my side gig your personal yeah. brand is everywhere you go and like you know I'm sure CBD chocolate is amazing but you're a clinical private practice Gyne- gynecologic oncologist. oncologist. Like, Very good. <laughs> the word in, incorrectly, too many uh, suffixes there. But um, but personal brand is still important, and and it's all layered. So we don't really realize that until we take a look at the roles that we play in our life, and it's like, oh, okay, that's my thing. And then and then it becomes this bigger, like, how can I get more of that? The stuff right. that does bring me joy, and how can I? How can I get rid of some of that other stuff where it's about finding your audience? And that's Marjorie, one of the things you talk about that I love is putting yourself in front of the people who want to hear what you have to say, because that exists for everybody, whether you're it's a committee at work or whether you are selling CBD chocolate. You know, it's it's branding isn't about making money necessarily. It's about finding your value in in what you bring out to the world. I think it's the communication tool that's almost like a matchmaker. I mean, obviously not in the romantic sense, but you know, the ideal would be for you to have a job where you got to do only the stuff that you loved and were awesome at. Yeah, but, <laughs> that would be wonderful. But most jobs require you to do some things that you're like kind of okay at, but someone else is maybe better at them. And some things that you just straight up don't like. And you know, there, I mean, there's always a mix, but the only way I think to really, you know, accelerate and streamline your advancement and your happiness is to know really clearly like what it is that you bring to the table that's great, that you like to do, that you're good at, and be able to communicate that to the people who are in a position to hire you or be your partners or be your clients or whatever. And then the ones who are like, yeah, we don't want that. 
super because you don't want them either. Right. Thank you. <laughs> that's not gonna work. And the ones that do want that are like, that's where that's where you belong and will thrive. And so being able to articulate it and show it in a way that the right people find you or the right people recognize you when, when you're standing in front of them um, is incredibly powerful. Um, and, and again, far more than what we could talk about today, though I want to. <laughs> but, it's, but it starts with doing exercises like this. It starts yeah. with these basics and then unpacking it, it turns into this whole like inspirational life aha moment kind of thing. Yeah. It's what yeah. I love about even doing, even though it's a schedule challenge, it turns into so much more. Should we yeah. go to the next? Yes. So yes. Yeah. So day four. So after we do all that, so we know, or actually day three, sorry. So we have our, we have our roles and goals and then we know how they got there. And then we talk about the value of establishing a policy, which in brief is just like one decision that eliminates a bunch of other decisions. So you don't have to have stress or have time wasted and you get frankly pretty automatic and good at your response. Um, and you know, the example that I used in the challenge was how Steve Jobs and some of the other famous super achievers wear the same clothes every single day. So they don't have to think about shopping and they don't have to think about what they're going to wear and they don't have to, they just don't have to think about it. Um, they probably don't get inundated with shopping emails every day like we do. You know, I mean, it, it <laughs> reduces a lot of other decisions and stimuli. So Aaron, tell us about one of the policies that you made because you wrote one down. I thought that was great. Yep. So my policy was that I would not accept, I'm, I'm reading, so I would not yeah. accept a new commitment, a meeting, a committee or anything without removing one from my plate, regardless of how interesting it was to me. So that's um, so fantastic because we're always going to have things that sound neat, right? And ideally, if we have that abundance, people are constantly coming to us with pretty good, pretty good things. But it's, so it's great to be able to acknowledge no matter how interesting or important, not going to do something new unless I exchange it for something else. And of course, that has some execution uh, nuances, mm -hmm. right? The bandwidth and, and other things, right? Uh, but that's a great policy because now it makes it really simple. Anything that comes to you, in order for you to make a decision, in order to say yes, you've got to say a no. And that just, that that's a great policy. I love it. Thanks. Um, okay, I'm gonna launch into, in the interest of time, day four, and Jill, unless you have a policy you wanna share. Uh, how about I don't do hemorrhoids? <laughs> One of the surgeons on Transform, that's her policy now. She's just like, I don't do hemorrhoids. Sorry. Like, it, she's just decided that's not something she's doing. Yes, that's extremely practical, right? She's a general surgeon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she just doesn't want to do yeah. hemorrhoids. And now she doesn't. It's yeah. great. And it's so simple and easy to understand. I just, I don't do that. Thanks. That's it. Oh, I guess I do have an easy policy, right? I don't do one on one coaching. People ask me all the time Can I call you? Can I talk to you? Can we book a call? And no, we cannot, except for this. <laughs> uh, I just, I just don't do that. I used to try to do it. And then it was just way too much, way too much demand for what, frankly, would just, if you sit out, just became unaffordable. So it felt unrealistic. My, my price felt silly because that was a reflection of the demand, but I knew that nobody was going to really want to pay it. It just seemed like a silly conversation. So yeah, I do it. I just don't do it. That made that easy. Okay. So then day four, we look back again at the same list, which now, of course, we have some nuances around in terms of policies, how we're going to approach it. And we know how it got there and, and all this other stuff. And then we're looking at emotional ties. So I gave a few different, because everyone's different emotionally, a few different ways to view this. There are three books um, that I was kind of drawing from. Uh, one is essentialism. And the idea around that is if it's not, you know, the absolute best opportunity, then it doesn't matter if it's pretty good, but the answer is no. Um, this is similar to Warren Buffett and some other really successful people's sort of philosophy that you say no to a lot of really great things to sp make that space for the best. And then uh, a lot of people know the book, which I guess I have actually never read, but the Marie Kondo uh, Joy of Tidying Up or something, yeah. where the whole idea, right, is that if you, as you're cleaning out your closet in your house, that when you pick up an object, if it does not fill you with joy, like it's out. And that you're supposed to have this, this like actual tangible reaction to it. Um, in a favorable way. Otherwise, it's gone. If you're just like, well, it's practical, like out, you know, you're supposed yeah. to have joy. Um, and then someone else's book that that essentially in a nutshell is if it's not a hell yes, then it's a no, right? If it's not a really enthusiastic yes. So we all, I think this, this is where things start to get a little trickier because many of us have a lot of things that are pretty good. We know we kind of like them. We know that they're important, right? To the society, to patients, to whatever, to yeah. ourselves. Right, they're not without value. It's easy to say something is not valuable or I hate it. It's hard to say, I like it and it's important and I'm not gonna do it anymore. That's a little <laughs> bit harder. 
So I don't know. Tell me about that part of your list. You and I haven't actually talked about this. I don't think. Did you no. have like that on your list? I I think. Well, I had some things like that because, as I said, I made made my list and I kept expanding it. And mm -hmm. some of the things are are your your life responsibilities. You know, my parents are getting older. I have in laws. I have these things that might not have topped my list of things to do to go home and take care of my dad after his heart surgery, but that's going to demand my time in that moment when and if that ever happened again. So yeah. some of them were on here that were, you know, I put into the accumulated category of like, well, th these are those things I have to do. I can't, can't cross off my parents or my in-laws. Um, and I'm saying that in the event, my parents are actually listening because they wanted to watch the webinar. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, my, original focus, yeah, my original focus for, for this was really to get rid of some committees. So I didn't cross off too much other stuff in the outside life, um, though I can see some of the goals I want to set from this too is like limiting my scrolling on Facebook and limiting like random stuff that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. Being um, a little more, yeah, deliberate. I think, you know, as you point, I mean, certainly you can always go back, right, and repeat this exercise. That's part of the yep. beauty challenge. <laughs> you were kind of viewing it for committees, but you could do it again for really any aspect of life or from, from all of life. And um, I know, I mean, for me, I, I had almost the polar opposite as I was going through this challenge. I became aware that there's a small handful of people that I work with in various different capacities that whenever I see them in my inbox, I get this like moment of dread of like, <laughs> you want to open it. I have that with it's a phone call. <laughs> it's like either their energy or just something. I don't know. But I mean, that just, it, it's not that I don't like the work and it's not that I don't like the people. So I was like, well, it's not like I don't like this. So why am I struck with that sort of, oh. and then I realized, you know, this is stuff that I either have avoided or accumulated or whatever, but it's time to go, right? It's just, mm -hmm. it's time to go. Uh, regardless of what all the logical things that I could say about it. And I feel like I have meditation to thank for this, by the way, because I first learned meditation at the first Transform Conference, which was just over a year ago, right? So we've done it twice now, so about a year and some months, and have been practicing it since then, since Jill taught me. And I really do feel like I have much more of an ability to listen to my intuition and then take some action on it, whereas before I would just like power through that feeling or squash it or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but but now I was able in this challenge, I didn't really, I certainly didn't design this challenge for myself, but I think I got a lot of benefit out of it um, to go through and, and see some stuff that I thought, well, wow, you know, I realized that I'm having this reaction. Like, what is that telling me? It's telling me that it's important for me to get it out of my life in some way. And not because it's like the big bad wolf, but for, for whatever reason, you know, um, so anyway, um, I think it kind of depends a little bit if you have um, things like that where you have this sort of visceral aversion. It's kind of easy. It was obvious to me to say I need to, to put a stop to some of these things. I think it's harder, frankly, to act on those things that are pretty good and worthwhile. That's a harder thing to, to eliminate. And I, I think as we get into day five and talk about some of some of the emails that you sent, we can get into that because I think it's it it's a different kind of discipline or response that you need to have, I think, to be able to tackle some of this. Um, but you, you need that intuition, I think, and you need to kind of tamp it down the, the fight or flight and these sort of false narratives that we tell ourselves. Because now that we're about to be on the fifth day, everyone's like ready for action. Like now that we've done the list four times, what are we going to do with it? And this is where most people, frankly, like fall apart or they get cold feet because yep. <laughs> they know what they ought to do, but they just like can't or won't don't mm -hmm. want to go through because of some self-limiting beliefs i think some narratives that we tell ourselves mm -hmm. about how other people are going to react to us or how we are somehow letting down or falling short or just not being the whoever that we're supposed to be um i'll i'll pause there and see if either of you guys want to add to that but that's what i think about that transition from the first four days into the fifth day i think um erin you brought up a good point like I can't get rid of my friends or family. And so um, I had, we, well, maybe we'll talk about this uh, later in the, in the webinar if we have time, but um, we heard from some people who were like, um, and a lot of people on the retreat did this as well, but the role in their family life, like I'm the, or, or their friends, like my friends all come to me, I'm the advice giver, I'm the, 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 the hugger, I'm the, the caretaker or whatever. Um, and I'm the doctor. Everyone, yeah. 
I'm the doctor, the right? Doctor. Exactly. Like, and that might make some people very happy, or it might be something that doesn't feel as good. So you don't have to necessarily cut the person out of your life, but what's the role you're playing that might make you feel icky setting boundaries? Uh, we had someone write in about, um, they were like used as a pawn between their family members and they were the one that was like the peacemaker and they were real tired of doing that. And so, so this isn't just about, Ooh, I don't like that committee, but yeah. what I love my family to varying, you know, everyone's got different amounts of how much they love their family. What can I do within those relationships in those roles that I'm playing in those relationships to make that an even better uh, relationship? So we'll get to that. I think a little bit later, Marjorie. Yeah, and all of this I think really, really resonates. We everything that we're saying here right now. I know that everyone, you know, watching, we can see a lot of people in the retreat and, and elsewhere, uh, almost saying the exact same words. Right. Th this is a really common shared experience. So whether it is um, at work or whether it's with family or whatever else, I mean, I'll just even say, you know, my husband. So because I'm the doctor, my husband, and he doesn't like blood and stuff. So he's always like, "What's wrong with the kids?" You know, if they get a scraped knee or something, like not only am I the mom, so mommy will fix your scraped knee, but I'm also supposed to be the one who makes the assessment of whether or not we need to go to the ER, right? Which sometimes feels overly burdensome. And my my son came home the other day, having been accidentally hit in the back of the head with a soccer ball, but like it was booted pretty hard. And so he was complaining of a headache and we were having dinner and my husband's like, his pupils are really big. We need to go to the ER. And I just was like, oh, okay, take him. <laughs> Bye. I, I had to, I had to, because I was like, my husband's getting all frantic. He won't have a concussion. I kind of doubt it. I mean, it wasn't like he had one small pupil and one big pupil. Then I would have known, you know, we need to go. Right. But he was just, I didn't really know exactly what to do. I, and I, and I do sometimes feel like, why does that all fall on me? And what if I get it wrong and blah, you know, and like, you know, but so it was, it was super, uh, this is not part of a policy or really anything, not nor part of a boundary, but it's sort of the practice of this kind of thing on the daily basis. I thought, you know what, honey, you're, this is an important consideration. Like, right, I'm, I'm concerned just like you. Why don't you take him to urgent care? That'd be super. Yeah. You know, we have a daughter, right? We have other things to do. Otherwise, we could all tr truck off together. But because, you know, one person was going to be the one doing the taking, I was like, well, super. It's a great opportunity for you to lead this. <laughs> you know, yeah. it doesn't have to be me because I have a medical degree. I'm not a pediatrician. I have no idea. I don't even think they do anything for concussions unless you have like a brain bleed. But I, you know, I was like, I don't yeah. think. I think they're going to send us home and tell us to like watch him, and then we'll promptly put him to bed. So, <laughs> but we should go. Let's go. <laughs> go ahead, and go. Um, and that made me feel good because it made me feel more shared, like a shared responsibility, yeah. right? Anyway, I had. Or fear if you said stuff. earlier that taking it away, my husband will usually text me near the end of the day and be like, how's the day? And he'll ask me, well, what do you want for dinner? I want to not make the decision about dinner. Yeah. I oh, want yeah. you to make dinner. Did you tell him that? Have you told him that? Oh, we, we have. We actually have that. Con we had that conversation sort of as part of this. And how did it, go? I said, it went really well. He's a, he, uh, he's a college football official, so he's home a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And so he has the opportunity to just make dinner. He knows what I like. If I'm not going to be home, he can make what he likes. I'm not that picky. Uh, well, actually, that's not true. I am that picky. He knows what I like. And I just, but I, I told him, I was like, I need you to make that decision because I am decision fatigued by the end of the day. I don't want to think about what's come, what I need to, what dinner, like just feed me when I get home. Yeah. And that's you actually gone really well. I would say he cooks dinner at home four of the five work nights, which is perfect. That's fantastic. And what I also really love about this is, I'm just guessing here, right? I'm projecting. Probably the reason he asks you that is because he wants to please you, right? He loves exactly. you. Exactly. No, he's totally, he you. thought it was totally he's well intended. That he wanted yeah. to ask me what I wanted. So yeah. he wasn't so doing you have it to be able to be like, I don't want to be asked. How about that? I love you making the dinner without right. asking. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's move in. So so my proposal for day five was an adaptation of the book, The Positive No. So some people are familiar with this formula, but basically it starts off with the statement of your yes, which is sort of your conviction of like, here's what's important to me, right? Um, and then you just in the middle then say what you're not going to do. So I no longer will be able to do blah, blah, blah. And then a favorable sentence at the end that is um, intended to sort of preserve relationships, but is not intended to open the doorway for negotiation. So 
some people misinterpret this as like trying to bury the no, sort of like with the feedback sandwich, like say something nice, say something. It's not that. It's just intended to anchor your no in something that's positive and firm, then to state sort of a non-negotiable policy, basically, and then to preserve relationships and sort of say what you can do. For example, the example I gave was, you know, if you're going to roll off of a committee, you're going to say, it's important to me that blah, 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 blah. So I'm no longer going to be able to do this. And then, you know, here's who I think would be a great replacement, which in my opinion is is better, but teach their own. It, I think it's better than saying, you know, I'll help you replace me because who knows how long that could go on. But it is still a favorable and sort of positive way to, to sum it up by saying, you know, here are my suggestions for how this work can go on uninterrupted. Um, so I know that you sent a handful of these mm -hmm. the committees you're mentioning. And I, uh, because uh, I just read this earlier today, you sent me yep. sort of an email in a nutshell. Um, one was uh, a response you got was very supportive, which was almost surprising to you, right? If I understood yeah. correctly. It was, it was validating because I, I stepped back from a committee and it was a committee that I, I don't even know how I got on. So, but I kept going to the meetings and, and uh, it was very validating to say like, I need to reevaluate. And the re respondent was like, you are absolutely right. You were very busy. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the suggestion of the person. Like, thank you for all that you do. And, and I, again, I think, as you said, the stories we tell ourselves, the stories I tell myself when I'm stepping back from things is they're going to think I'm not that busy. They're going to think that I'm not, you know, they're going to think all the things that I thought right. they could think. They're going to be disappointed really and you're going to be letting them down. And exactly. you, know, you don't have a good enough reason to want to not do this and et cetera, right? All of those things. Um, and then it turned out to be, they had a lot of gratitude for what you had done and they were thankful and they un totally understood. Yep. So sometimes that's great because that'll happen. I mean, sometimes people might have their feathers ruffled, but a lot of times people will flat out be supportive. And even if they aren't, you'll realize that they at least accept it and the sky doesn't yep. fall and then it's off the plate. Yes. And then another one you told us about was actually a real <laughs> big surprise in another way. So, so tell this story because for folks who are listening, this is an incredible, I mean, I'm blown away by this, right, Jill? Oh, can I just so, preface that like Aaron had sent an email being like, I had some surprising results from some of the things and Marjorie and I were like, oh God, did she like get fired because of our, <laughs> what have we done, you know? And so like, that's our mindset going into it was like, oh Lordy, did we give really bad advice? So Aaron, go ahead with no. And so, so one of the committees was a committee that um, I had like was asked to speak at, at one point, was asked to join. Um, I didn't know like what this committee reported to. I didn't know, you know, it just kind of existed. Um, and some of the other committees I was on kind of did the same stuff. And so it was one that I was like, okay, uh, you know, I can't. I can't do this one anymore, so I'm gonna step back. And I gave suggested again some people that would be good. And then like two days later, I got an email back and I was like, hold on, Aaron. So yeah. we're gonna come back because this punchline is really important, but I want to just make a little correction oh, yeah. or catch, right? When you said I can't do this anymore, it's never I that want you to. Know, right? I, I I'm not doing this anymore, yeah. right? I, I won't be doing this anymore, or I won't be, you know, but but it's never that I can't. Yeah. Um, no, and of I course. Know. If that doesn't feel authentic to you, like say whatever you want. I know that you uh, shared with us what you actually wrote, but I thought I would point that out because we do often, right. that's all tied up in that internal narrative as well, right? Of like, I can't, or I'm somehow a failure or a letdown or whatever, or that somebody else then will be like, well, sure you can, right. you know, how can we help you? So you can, can. Um, it's just so non-negotiable to be like, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. Anyway, so yeah. you told me you were not going to be doing it anymore. You gave some suggestions and they came back with, and two days later, an email came out to everybody on the committee that said, you know what, we realize uh, we're going to disband this committee because we we uh, don't, we're, it's kind of duplicated and we don't need this committee anymore. And so I just looked at it, I, could, wow. I just sat there and I thought, wow, so because I evaluated my time, I just saved a bunch of other people who come to this monthly meeting another hour of their day because we th somebody took a critical look and said this is yeah. this doesn't help any of us like we're right. not doing anything and so that was that was really i i, la I laughed uh, that's that awesome. my honest reaction because i was just like oh my god the committee is canceled so okay good 
th Done. then it was then I'm very validated in dropping okay. that one because yeah, that's uh, definitely that's not necessary. Well, validation, right? <laughs> not only do you not need to be part of it, but neither does anybody else, and it doesn't <laughs> really exist. Uh, that's amazing. That's amazing. I love that. Um, there was another one in there that was sort of easy. You sort yeah. of described it as a softball, right? It was a no brainer. Um, I was I asking you. But it was a national committee. So that was one of the ones that I was keeping around because I was on a national committee. It was with the really important people, even though I couldn't tell you who any of these real important people are. But, you know, and so I I felt like I should keep doing it, except for I would attend the the conference calls, which some people were live for and some of us called in for. And they would often like showing slideshows we didn't have access to or videos and you know, the conference call in real life is a horrible, horrible way to communicate. And, and so I finally was like, I don't need, no, I don't, I don't need this at all. Like I have contributed zero to this committee. Like they, I'm just going to step back. And that was an easy email. I didn't even, no, I actually still, I still suggested someone who could, could take my role, but I was just like, nope, we're done. Like this was an easy done. And I have saved that email because I sent you guys what I said. I saved that email in my drafts so that I know the next time something comes up, I don't have to dig through anything. I have a copy of what I'm going yeah, to say the absolutely. next time I need to step back. That's great. And you've got your policy. And also, was it was there, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but was there a feeling of like relief or of stress offloading from having removed yourself from that, even though it was sort of a softball? Like oh my God, yes. No, all of them. All Because yeah. none of these, these three were the... The time sucks because, as you said, they're on your calendar. You go like I was still going to them, but you know they're on your calendar. But you you walk out and you're like, ah, oh, I don't know why I just went. That's that's an hour I'll never get back, you know. And so, so in in that way, it was. But it was a relief because I thought like, okay, that's three extra hours a month that I now have. Yes. And that I need, and that I want. I need exactly my my battery's gonna die. So I'm plugging in. You wouldn't think that a computer would lose an entire full charge in one webinar. We must be like super energetic. <laughs> Something <laughs> here because it was fully plugged in when I moved it here. Okay. No, that that's great. I think a lot of people can relate to that as well. I mean, it, it and it goes to show that value of really taking a careful look at the things you've accumulated and the things that are just kind of hanging around that are not bad necessarily, right? But that are just you know, they're, they're also not good. And to some degree, even if you say, oh, I know I can't go, nobody's going to miss me. It's no big deal. Just getting it like completely gone. Mm -hmm. It's it much, it, there's just, there is something relieving about getting that out. Absolutely. Out. Okay. Um, all right. So this is, this is awesome. So I want to talk a little bit about how to apply this in a, a different kind of environment. And so Jill, I'd like to ask you to chime in if you will a little bit, because we've been talking about pretty traditional medical types sure. of separate committees, right? Um, we did have people who applied this to a whole variety of, of things in their lives and sent us some stories. I don't know, did any pop to mind, Jill, to you uh, from the recent Transformed or from um, communications that you've had about how to sort of implement this positive no other than sending an email? I think that uh, one of the women, she had the like fancy administrative role and she was like, all I really want to do is like see patients and like volunteer at the zoo because I love animals. And we were all just like, we love you so much, <laughs> you know, and it was just the best. So earnest and wonderful. She just was like, I'm not made to be an administrator. I think she'd come into medicine as a, like a second or maybe even a third career. So she hadn't even been doing it that long. And I think she just went in and met with her boss. She made the appointment with him, I believe, while we were still in Mexico and then went in the day we got back and was like, hey, I'd love to do only clinical. This administrative stuff isn't for me. And he said, great, perfect, yeah. like, sounds good. And he just gave her back her clinical time and that was it. And then she blew her mind completely, as I recall. The zoo and like the docent thing wasn't available, but she signed up for the thing that is available for the next six months and boom, that was it. Yeah. And she had been like, in turmoil before the retreat, like struggling with how does she do this? And, and, and it was just met with him, told him. Yeah. I would go even farther. I think when she showed up for the retreat, she had the mindset that this was not a possibility, sure. right? This, yeah. this was not even possible. And then on the first day she told us that's what she wanted to do. 
And then I recall um, observing her in some of the other sessions also some of the meditation and sort of mindfulness uh, in the tapping session um, really. And as I mentioned, this is transformed is very unique. It's very holistic. There's a lot of different stuff that we do there to try to bring all of this together. Um, I feel like I heard her expressing so much fear about they're never going to let me, they're going to say, no, what if this, what if that, you know, there's no possible way forward for me. And that within just like two, three days, she had worked that out mm -hmm. to like 100% her exact ideal preference which of course doesn't happen for everybody at everything, right? But, but, and then like a week later, she had volunteered, she got interviewed, she was a volunteer at the zoo, right? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> oh, it's the best. Okay. Um, all right. Let's talk now a little bit in the last couple of minutes. We have technically three minutes left, but we can go over a little bit because I do, if you can hang around, Erin, for five mm -hmm. more minutes. Um, yep. So one of the things that we want to talk about is what do we do when we get stuck? A lot of people just flat out get stuck by day five. I think part of what helps, yeah. especially at the retreat and perhaps here today and having this challenge is that group, right? That group support where, you know, with other women physicians who like have lived in, in that parallel life to yours that really get the kind of pressure and the narratives and the stuff that we're subjected to, you start to really feel like lots more things are possible. And then you start to realize, well, they really are possible. And then you start to be able to do them. And I think that's part of what makes people able to move from day four to day five. Um, but tell us about, there was one email you did not send, at least one email that you did not send. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that situation? Because I'm finding it really interesting. Yeah. So this was a role that um, last year in like about October time, I was approached by the person who was in the role at the time who was, you know, senior to me and very much was like, I think you'd be great at this. I think you should do it. And the role as it was at that moment, didn't seem like it was a lot of work, still seemed to align with what I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, it was a cancer related role. That's you know, my two passions are surgery and cancer. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. And it was like, great, okay. And when you're out at the American College of Surgeons conference, go to this thing, cause they're gonna kind of introduce it. And what they did at that conference was totally change the job description, like 100% what it was. Oh, it's not that anymore. It is the quality director and the quality projects and, and this and change this too. And, and I sat there and I sat there at the meeting like, oh God like, oh, this was not what I wanted. Right. Okay. And so even when I came back and we were talking through it, the people on the executive level recognized, they're like, so are, are you okay with the change? And I was like, no, no, I'm really not. Like, this wasn't what I signed up for. Yeah. But okay. Like I just took this role. Fine. I will, I will do it, you know, for as short of a period of time as I need to. But like, I, all right, I'll just, I'll, I'll power through. Um, and, and I, I still don't like it, um, but I'll do it. And, you know, again, stories I'm telling myself about it. I can't give it up. I just took it. Like, mm -hmm. who am I going to give it to? The, the whole reason the senior surgeon asked me is because the other person that would be a candidate for it is just out of training. And, do you overwhelm that person or am I overly protecting that person? You know? And so, so I was like, all right, I'll do it. And then another opportunity came up that is much more in line with what I want to do. It is the cancer leadership and how we're going to build the program and how it's going to expand and what it's going to look like and how everything's going to get coordinated. And that is the stuff that I am actually passionate about. And so now you've got your policy that right. says you can do the one without Unless addressing. I give the something else up, and uh, and so I sit on that because I'm like, mm. and I also um, so what I've done so far is I I am setting up an appointment with our chief medical officer to have a good conversation about what the new role actually looks like, because my other concern is. I've given up some small things, but mm -hmm. I don't know that I, even though I said trade one for one, I have a feeling this might be like a five for one thing. Yeah. Um, but it may be one for one with that current role. Um, uh, but to really kind of get the information to also make sure I don't sign up for something again, that's going to have the rug pulled out from under me on. 
yep. um, in that role. Uh, and so by having that conversation, and I've already, you know, the the committee that I'm on for the role that I don't want recognizes, the, at least the executive people recognize that this is not what I want. And yeah. So it's not going to come as a drastic surprise if I say, I don't want this anymore because this other opportunity has come up. Yeah, and I'll offer also just knowing you for the one hour that I have. <laughs> so, you, you know, doing quality reporting metrics and reports and stuff is perhaps not only not only what you don't like, but it may not be aligned with your best value, right? No, it's if not my skill set. Your time, <laughs> it's your skill set. If someone's going to get the very best, most awesomeness from you, what does that awesomeness look like? Probably not a PSQI report. No, you know, you, are, you have something different and there's somebody else, no offense, who will do that job better than you. So much because better. Not only will they like it, but they may have more skill in it, right? So you're, you're mismatched in that. And yet there's this feeling of like, if I don't do it, who will do it? Will this person do it? If I, should I protect them? Um, so I wrote down a couple of things because of course I don't have an answer to this solution. <laughs> it sounds like you're getting closer and closer yeah. uh, every time. But one of the things that I wrote down first that I just wrote down again is who's ultimately responsible for filling this position? This is a, I think an important question to get clarity on because you have said a few things that make it seem as though you feel that because you're in the role, it's your responsibility to pass the torch. But I would submit, unless you are the CEO of the hospital or something, that uh, it's not, right? Someone else no. is accountable no. for the role, right? And you could resign from it. Is that right? I mean, could. Yeah. I'm not no. thinking that's what you have to do. I'm just- I could, I could say, I, yes, I, I technically serve probably the second in command role on this committee. Um, but yes, ultimately, it is not my job. And it's that's not also something yeah. I had to learn through my burnout phase. It is not my job and it is not my responsibility to fix that. That's now, right. There are ties in that of like really important things like accreditation and stuff that I also need to make sure still happens, which is part of the why I worry. But you're right. Well, it's wait, not my so worry. Question. Do you need to make sure that accreditation for your hospital still happens? Or, or am I just hearing you say that you endorse the importance of that? Like I you endorse get, the importance yeah. of it. I, but that's you not know. for you to wear on your back, right? Nope, if it were, my... your pay grade would be higher. Someone <laughs> else in an office somewhere else is responsible, for is responsible for that. And I think that's so important. We very often just like feel the the fixer need of like well I'm holding it right now if I if no one else wants to take that from me then I must hold it for forever, but that's not the case. Oh. Um, and of course I don't want to minimize the fact that there's you know, there are always relationships at work. There's reputational capital right that you spend or or don't when you agree to do stuff, don't agree to do stuff. So I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but I do want to acknowledge that this. It sounds like and you've confirmed it's not your uh, responsibility to nope. fix. No. And stepping back from it, would it jeopardize, do you think, your actual job security in any nope. way? Okay. And then do you feel like the surgeon, that you felt very complimented that the senior surgeon thought of you and recommended you. Um, do you feel like that person has gone out on a limb for you in any way that you would need to kind of uh, no. repair or pre-address before you step out? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> so then you have the meeting that you just said you were going to have and not only make it clear to this person that this isn't something you're going to continue doing, um, but you might not even, because I have written down, you might have to just um, uh, work on a timeline. Like, and I will be stepping down and here's the time. But you might not even need to offer that, depending on you know how you feel about it. And then whether or not, of course, there's anyone you can think of that has the skill set. Because when we talk about branding, professional branding is a two-way street. So there may be someone who has the skill set to do this job that doesn't know about this job or that has not articulated to you or others that you know. Mm their interest or their skill set and their aptitude. So there might be a really great match. So you've said nobody wants to do this. There's a possibility that maybe just nobody knows what the job is. And if they True. did. And like, especially because hey. it's changed. So especially because it's changed. And also, since it's uh, quality and safety, it might be something that for someone else, not you, is um, a recruitment advantage or even an opportunity, right, for your institution or for your group. So when you're having your conversation with with somebody else, that might be something worth um, bringing up is whether or not, although it's nothing you want anything to do with, 
maybe it's actually like a recruiting tool or right. something an advantage um, for someone else. And then I did, you know, what any modern person does, which is I tried to crowdsource this. And so I asked Twitter in a group, obviously anonymized. I asked uh, what people might do. And most people suggested something kind of along the lines of what I just rattled off already. But one person did ask if it could be divided or partially delegated. I thought that was an interesting question. I don't know. Um, but again, not your problem. To fix. Not your problem to fix. Nope. No, nope. it's You're nice right. to have those suggestions, right? To give, but but if you don't have to, don't don't take it on as your problem to fix. I know it, it probably seems like, or at least to me earlier, it seemed like there wasn't a very clear chain of command of who you would even be kind of resigning from. Like, who do you? Yeah, it's, or it's the CEO or the CMO. No, it would be the the CMO is more is going to be more in charge of the leadership uh, vision of the cancer center part. So I want to get more information about that. Um, pretty much know who I'd resign to. You do. I, I, I think I will look at a lot of sad faces um, with this one. And I think even though, again, the executive committee knows that this wasn't what I wanted, um, I think they'll still be like, oh, but we really thought maybe you could you just suck it up for the year till we finish what we yeah. finished. Um, so but you don't have to do that. But you it's not have my. To suck it up. It's well, not. It, you could always I, decide to, but you don't have to, right? Yeah. You don't have to. And and whatever you decide to do, you're the one who has to live with that, right? Yeah. You're the one that who goes on living that life that you basically are setting up through some kind of willful choice today and tomorrow and going forward. So I hope you will stay in touch with us and tell us you know. how this unfolds. Well, as I, mm. as I even said after where I was like, oh, I don't feel like I could, that there's anybody else. And then in parentheses, I said, and I know that's all the story I'm telling myself, but I should just step down from this because I should and take on what I'm actually interested in. Why am I punishing myself? Like, It's a very <laughs> fair question. It is. This makes me want to do a tapping session with you. We do this <laughs> in addition to meditation. I do this thing called tapping, which helps people deal with self-limiting beliefs and deal with the uncomfortable emotions they have. So this like, even though I feel responsible for whatever, you know, and we tap through it and then you're like, oh, and it like changes the way your brain processes that emotion. Oh, nice. Um, instead of like telling yourself, you actually internalize nice. the, the new approach to it um so I, i'm like oh let's let's go there let's do some time this, this, all is just saying i need to sign up for this retreat <laughs> <laughs> well i hope that you will want to no, and bring your friends, but um but but truly what's been i think most helpful about or, or most most fun for me um is is being able to watch you through these five days and seeing your stories kind of seeing you go through it and you know the i mean the whole reason that i do uh any of this work and i think Jill probably feel similarly is because it's so gratifying to be able to see uh, these kinds of breakthroughs for people, which, you know, are small, but huge, right? Yeah. It's like, like a little thing, but a big thing. And, and I got to do it too, right alongside and, you know, tell my husband to take his, his son to the ER and my son, <laughs> our yep. son. To the ER. <laughs> and I got to, uh, to realize that there are emails that I hate and, you know, I'm certainly not perfect with the answers. And I to do this kind of work on an ongoing basis and nothing makes me sort of more fired up to do it again than to talk to people like you who are doing thank you kind of work so it, it's really fantastic i will i'm going to go ahead since you mentioned it and put a plug in here for folks who are watching um that you can sign up now and it's january 20th okay. through the 24th in 2021 right so it's almost a year away it's in cancun um and right now on the website it's transformed.org uh, we have a first dibs lock-in rate going on. We only are going to offer this for the first 10 people who sign up. But if they uh, sign up with the first dibs lock-in rate, right now it's a $500 savings, which is the biggest discount that we plan to offer. Um, but we will also match that. So if we go to a lower price at some point for whatever reason, if you are part of the first dibs lock-in rate, you not only have your spot, you have a sort of guaranteed lowest rate. You are also committed to come, so you're locked in. So, you know, take a look at it. You can register. Yeah. Uh, the normal way as well, which allows you to cancel, but you know, it's a, it's a steep, steep savings and an extra uh, guarantee for folks who really want to reserve a spot. Cause as we mentioned in the beginning, this is a very small group. It's not podiums. There's no lectures. There's no mic. Like, I think that's maybe our rate limiting, like 
if we would need a microphone, then we'd cut off. Uh, that's the limit. Right. We want to be able to work with and talk to everybody. And we want to be able to do it in this kind of a hands-on way where we aren't giving a lecture and someone's like, take it or leave it, or maybe, you know, going snorkeling. We want, you know, we, I mean, people do have time to go to the beach, but we make, you know, everything is sort of deliberate and built in and um, is a true action session. So, um, that, that's why we keep it the size that we keep it. And that's why having the, the lock-in is important because when it fills, it, it fills. And nice. we certainly have people ask when it's too late and we can't, in the way that we could, if we said, oh yeah, let's just bring in five more chairs into a conference, uh, you know, into an auditorium, we can't right. do that. Yeah. Um, so for you, please come and tell your friends to come. But Absolutely. of course, for watching this too, also please come. We will be sure to post uh, links where we post this replay that will have um, a handful of things I think we mentioned, obviously, a link to the registration form. I will put a link to um, the True Values Challenge that I mentioned on my blog. Um, Jill, since you brought up tapping, we should put a link to your tapping information. Oh, cool. And um, oh, and of course, uh, anyone who's watching this will also have had access to all of the five days of lessons so they can look and, and review all of this stuff as well. Um, I mean, with that, I think we should wrap because now we're a little bit over time. I appreciate everyone who stayed on with us for these extra 13 minutes. I appreciate you, Erin, being oh, thank you. Yeah, you were amazing. I, you were so I good. appreciate you guys reaching out and, as I said, running the challenge. I had a lot of friends on Instagram that would, as I would post things, would be like, that's a great idea. Like, you know, like, what? Are, and they were my non-medical friends. Yeah. They like, I need to do something like that. So I think we all need to take a moment and reevaluate and figure out what we actually want to be doing. Absolutely. We we do need to do that. And we get very, very busy on that hamster wheel and we forget to do what again is the sort of mission, our mission in, in transform is this alignment. You know, people talk about, is it work-life balance? Is it work-life integration? I mean, I think the fact is you're alive, you have values, you have emotions, you have purpose, and that needs to be aligned with what you do. Mm -hmm. And whether that's work or life or family or whatever, uh, people need alignment and uh, in our view, and Jill, Jill's view, in my view, you can't do it by doing these kind of exercises unless you also create that bandwidth of sort of emotional resilience, you know, stress reduction and mental clarity to be able to really execute. So uh, we, we yep. like to put it all together and people roll out with just magical stories, which is awesome. why we keep showing up and why we're so thankful to have you here. So thanks, yeah. Erin. Thank, thank you, guys. With that, we'll end the webinar. And everyone who's on, uh, thank you for joining. And for folks who've, who've caught it, uh, we're, we're about to cut. So um, make sure you're signed up for our newsletter. We'll continue to send out transformed related information. You can always, of course, come to my blog, MarjorieStegerMD.com, where I have a lot on professional branding, a lot on uh, career development. And Jill's website, uh, Jill, which one do you want? MeditationAndMedicine.com. MeditationAndMedicine.com for meditation, for chaos to calm, for tapping, and for more. So um, with that, thank you, everybody.